All right, well, good morning, everybody. We're doing session number five. We talked last week about um, creation, about how our view of creation is rooted in reality. It's not just something that we kind of make up, but that really the, the best you know, modern discoveries in science really kind of lend themselves to uh, a Christian worldview. And then uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the resurrection of Jesus and why that, really that is the cornerstone of our faith, right? Um, if there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then, well, we're wasting our time. Uh, so we're going to talk about the historical evidence for the resurrection, which is really cool because in other faiths, you don't have this type of historical, you know, kind of like hard evidence uh, to go back to uh, when it comes to what we would consider the miraculous. Because certainly somebody rising from the dead is miraculous. It doesn't happen ever unless God does it. Okay, so uh, let's open up to our study guides on that first page. How do we know what we know about the past? So like we discussed last week, science is not the only way we know things. When it comes to past events, we rely upon the historical witness of others. So for example, how would we know that Caesar Augustus at one time existed? I mean, you can't do an experiment called the Caesar Augustus experiment and demonstrate that he existed. How do we know that the guy existed? History. History. History, but how do we know history? Because people write it. Okay, because people write it. Do they write it, like, recently? Probably. But how, the people who wrote your history book, how do they know? Because it's been passed down from generation to generation. Okay. Do we have anything that we could, like, look at? Oh yeah, historical documents, yeah. We could look at historical documents that talk about Caesar Augustus, yeah. Um, we could also find some other things, maybe artifacts, right? Um, maybe you could find an artifact with an engraving in it that mentions his name. That's actually how we're able to date a lot of the things that happen in the Bible, especially in the book of Acts, because we found inscriptions that mention rulers uh, governors and, and uh, other uh, people uh, in the Roman world, and they're mentioned in the Bible. And if we know when that person was ruling, we know when this certain thing in the Bible happened. It's kind of cool. Um, so, what about uh, the names of your ancestors? How would you find that out? Yeah, and do we generally believe those is true? And we don't have any reason to believe that they're forged or made up or anything. Yeah. How about uh, if you wanted to find the date they came to the United States? Where might you take a trip? Yeah, maybe Ellis Island. You might find their name. You might find them on the books. Yeah. So thinking in terms of our Christian worldview, how can we know the following statement in Luther's catechism is true? So let's just all speak this together, since we do this at church so often. This is the second article of the Creed, and this is about redemption. This is about how God has saved us, and this is how it goes. Let's speak it together. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, is there any way to historically verify that these things happened? I don't think so. Can we verify there was a guy named Pontius Pilate? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we don't just have that in the Bible. We get that from, from other sources. Yeah. Would you be able to confirm he was crucified and killed because of like the records of the tombs and stuff? A lot of those are lost um, yeah. because Jesus wasn't, he didn't really have any social status. He was, you know, more of a, uh, a Jewish peasant. You know, he, he wasn't, um, although he was popular among the Jewish people, uh, the Romans, they're not going to really keep records of that, I don't think. But we do know that crucifixion was the normal way that you killed people who uh, were guilty of like insurrection or, or something like, like that. Insurrection, like you're trying to overthrow the government. Uh, so a lot of times non-Roman citizens in the ancient world would be crucified. We have artifacts, we have um, 
for example, an ossuary where they found the, uh, the wrist bones, or rather the feet, uh, with nail in them. They obviously they couldn't get the nail out, so they left it in there. Um, so we do have some evidence of Pontius Pilate of crucifixion. Uh, no historical person, no credible historian would ever say that Jesus doesn't exist. I mean, if you were a, even a, a non-Christian historian, if you said Jesus doesn't exist, you'd get laughed at. There, there's no credible historians that would say that Jesus did not exist and that he was not crucified. But let's move on to the next part. What does this mean? Let's speak it together. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. Now, if this is not true, we're in a whole lot of trouble, right? Now, these things are only true that you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven, that you've been, uh, that you're part of God's kingdom, that you have everlasting life. These things are only true if Jesus was raised from the dead, right? So if we were to say that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, uh, what we just said would kind of look like this, right? I mean, he would... Jesus would not be the true God begotten of the Father. He has not redeemed you. He has not purchased and won you from your sins. Uh, you don't have uh, the hope of everlasting life. I mean, do, do you see why this is important? I mean, there are some people who call themselves Christians who will try to do away with the resurrection and say, well, you know, Jesus just kind of pretend rose from the dead. He was spiritually raised from the dead. But Paul would say, look, if Jesus wasn't raised, don't bother. Go find something else to do. So, for example, look at, um, look at this from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is, like, really honest about the resurrection. He's like, look, they're trying to kill me for saying that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I gave up my life as a Pharisee. I have a lot of reasons to not want to believe that Jesus was raised. But he says this. I don't have it printed in your study guides. It's up on the screen here. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So Paul's like, if Jesus wasn't raised, I'm just making stuff up. And my preaching is worthless. And your faith is worthless. Verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, not something you want to do, because we testified about God that he has raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So Paul is just really straight up, very clear, that Jesus was raised. Because if he wasn't, then Paul's like, why am I putting my life on the line? And you know that Paul eventually lost his head for Jesus. Um, so when we, uh, we look at the, uh, the historical evidence for the resurrection, you know, we have some evidence about Jesus, and we have some evidence about the claim that Jesus was raised from the dead from non-biblical sources. Um, but within the New Testament itself, we consider this to be a reliable historical document. You have here a picture of a, of a very early papyrus manuscript. We've got thousands of New Testament manuscripts, and they're all very close um, uh, to the actual writing of them in comparison with other ancient sources. So, like, we've got the writings of Aristotle, we've got the writings of Plato, but they're usually, you know, a good, you know, maybe 700, 800 years removed from uh, when it was written and when it was copied. But uh, with the New Testament, we're getting like really close. 
we might have some from the first century, but for sure we've got documents from the, the second century, which really clay, uh, places it in close proximity. So this is an early uh, manuscript here, it's called a papyri. Uh, I think this is number 76, they number these manuscripts. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at just two portions of scripture that, uh, that really show how the New Testament writers considered what they were doing to be history. So when Paul sat down to write his letters, when uh, Luke sat down to write his gospel, they considered themselves to be writing factual history. So let's look at this first one from Luke. And as we look at this, I want you to circle any words or any phrases that you think show that the writers are doing history, that they're really reporting factual things. So like if we began this as like once upon a time, you'd probably say, oh, this is just a story. But look at this as history. All right, here we go. Paul's tired. Luke says, beginning his gospel, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. What words or phrases do you hear in this that are indicative of history, that kind of make you think of history yet? Yeah. Well, it mentions a historical figure by name, Theophilus. Oh yeah, Theophilus. Yeah, that could have been the patron who uh, paid for the writing of the gospel, because they were expensive back then. Yeah. What else? Historical words that make you think of history. Eyewitnesses, because in history you need eyewitnesses, right? People who see things. That's actually how all history comes to us, is on the basis of eyewitnesses. I mean, even if we find an artifact with an engraving on it, we need to connect it to a story that's written down. Uh, so everything that we know about everything that's happened in the past in human society comes from stories written down, right? You know about George Washington. You know about Abraham Lincoln. You know about Gettysburg because it was written down, right? So eyewitnesses. People saw it and wrote it down. What else? How about narrative? To compile a narrative, you know, what happened? The things that have been accomplished among us, things happened. Delivered is an important word in verse 2, that people in, have, have really important information and they deliver or pass it on. Having followed all things closely, so, so Luke is like following this closely, he's interviewing people, he's getting witnesses. Um, and then orderly account, so that you might have certainty. Yeah. Now what's really interesting is that if you look at uh, the ancient practice of writing history in the Roman and the Greek world, uh, Luke is really, in many ways, following the careful practice of writing history. Let's look at another one. This is from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We just quoted a portion of chapter 15 a moment ago. Paul says, now once again, think history here, okay? Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. What makes you think of history here? 
he's listing a bunch of people that could testify as to they say, hey, we also saw two. He's naming his witnesses. And were these witnesses still alive? Yeah. They were. So you could go, you could go talk to him. In fact, Paul said, hey, there's like 500 people plus you could go cross-examine. <clears throat> this didn't happen in a corner, he's saying. What else that makes you think of history here? How about this? And then, and then, and then, and then. Paul's laying out like a, a very detailed account of how this happened. Uh, now, let me ask you this. Where do you think Paul got this, this, it's kind of like a formula he's reciting. Um, in fact, a lot of scholars think that these words are not Paul's own. They were words that were handed down to him. They were kind of like a creed that the church knew these words. They summarized what happened to Jesus, that he was crucified and that he was buried and that he rose from the dead and that he was seen by Peter and that he was seen... Uh, by over 500, and then the apostles, and then me. That this was a um, kind of like a creed, like we say at church. Now the question, though, is where did Paul get this from? And when did he get it? So Paul's writing this about 20 to 25 years after Jesus was raised from the dead. That's, that's not a long time. I mean, if you think about legends and myths, they take a long time to develop. In fact, they usually develop after the people involved have died. You've got 25 to 25 years after Jesus was raised from the dead, you've got the church with this formula that they speak that everybody kind of knows about what happened. That in itself is impressive historically, but, but where did Paul get this from? And when did he get it? Any guesses? Do you know how... Uh, so Paul was converted shortly after Jesus was raised from the dead, right? Do you know where Paul went after he was converted? In Galatians, it says he went to Jerusalem. You know who he talked to when he was in Jerusalem? Peter and James and the other apostles. In fact, it says that, that, that uh, the word that, uh, that, we, that Paul uses in Galatians to talk about his visit to Peter is the same word that we use to get the word history. So what do you think Paul was up to when he went to go see Peter? He's like, Peter, I, I've just seen the risen Christ, and wow, <laughs> surprise, this Jesus I was out to, uh, whose church I was out to persecute, he's alive. Everything's flipped upside down for Paul, so he's got to go to Peter and, and check out the details. Now, when did this happen? Well, maybe one to three years after Jesus was raised. So that means that one to three years after Jesus was raised, Paul is going to Peter to get this statement that he's speaking 20 to 25 years later to the Corinthians. But when Paul went to go get it, it was already formulated. So do you see how close the event is to the eyewitness account? I mean, this is close. Historically speaking, it doesn't get much better than this. And then, you know, uh, Paul, uh, the, the Gospel of Luke, we don't really know when the Gospel of Luke was written. It might have been written maybe in like the, the 60s or 70s. Um, that's a couple decades after Jesus was raised from the dead. But the story we get in Luke is the same story that Paul has. Jesus was crucified. He was raised. He appeared in the body. You know, things don't change. Um, all right, so we're going to watch a quick video here. And this is uh, the resurrection of Jesus from the, histor uh, the, the perspective of a historian. So this is just looking at the evidence through the unbiased perspective of a historian. Um, let's just pull this up here. Is this up on the screen? Where'd it go? I don't know why it does this, but I end up having to do this kind of thing here. And then I have to do it backwards. Paula Fredrickson, Boston University. I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. 
that's what they say, and then all the historical evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus, I don't know what they saw, but I know that as a historian, they must have seen something. Is there any reason to believe that an extraordinary event like the resurrection actually happened? We might be encouraged to know that since the first Christians made the claim that the resurrection was Jesus' physical body coming to life and leaving an actual, literal tomb, as opposed to simply a spiritual belief that Jesus had come back again as a ghost or was alive in their hearts as a memory, it can be studied in the same way other historical events can be. Like Hannibal's invasion, complete with the elephants, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, or the Broncos being crushed by the Seahawks in Super Bowl 48. Historical research is well respected, even though, unlike scientific research, you cannot place historical events under a microscope or contain them to a lab. Historians put reports together from written sources and eyewitnesses or anything else that was known from the time and place of the events to reach reasonable conclusions about what may have actually happened. While many pieces of evidence can be used to point to the reality of Jesus' resurrection, we will focus on three. Number one, the early church exploded on the scene of the ancient world with the claim that Jesus had risen from the dead as their central proclamation. Many movements are gradual in building momentum and when it comes to larger than life, legendary or miraculous characteristics claimed by these movements about their leaders, those ideas usually take decades and sometimes even centuries to develop. From what we know about Christianity, the claim that Jesus rose again from the dead was made from the very start, serving as this new religion's central idea. A passage that is thought to reflect the very earliest Christian belief, a founding Christian leader writes, I want to remind you of the good news I proclaimed to you. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again from the dead. Within a very short time, this movement had taken the ancient world by storm built on the testimony of those who claimed they had seen Jesus alive after death. There is every indication that they must have seen something. Number two, the earliest followers of Jesus claimed to be eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection and went to their deaths proclaiming it. Now we all know people die for their beliefs. That does not make their beliefs true. But one thing it does for all of them it is a very strong indicator that they believed what they were saying. It's been said, liars make lousy martyrs. The early followers of Jesus claimed first to have seen Jesus die and raise again from the dead. Their deaths are an indication that they certainly believed they had. They must have seen something. Number three, Jesus' resurrection was seen by his earliest followers and friends. But in addition, a very unusual thing happened around the same time. Two men, who were self-described skeptics, even enemies of the idea of Jesus' divinity, turned from their skepticism to claim that they had seen the resurrected Jesus. The first was Jesus' own brother James. Historians are confident that we have good information regarding James, and we know he began as a skeptic over Jesus' claims to divinity. From what we know, he appears to have thought Jesus was decidedly not the Son of God, but also that his brother was a little on the kooky side, which, if you have a brother, you may be able to relate to. But somehow, James makes a complete turnaround in his view of Jesus, and the explanation he gives is, the resurrected Jesus appeared to him. He must have seen something. Then there was a man named Saul of Tarsus. He not only did not believe in Jesus, but when the news about him began to travel, he believed this new movement was a dangerous and destructive idea. He took it upon himself to oppose believers, even violently. He had people killed and put in prison just for believing in the resurrection. Then suddenly, Saul does one of the most amazing 180s in the history of 180s. He goes from sworn enemy of the new faith to one of its most passionate and vocal promoters. What happened? According to him, the resurrected Jesus appeared to him. He went to his death, never backing off that claim. He must have seen something. Atheist New Testament scholar Jed Luden. It must be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. 
Um, so, think about like a lowest common denominator, like the, the, the bare minimum that people can agree on. If we were to boil down the evidence for Jesus and his resurrection down to like the bare minimum that, that all historians would agree on, what would it be? Um, I've got them here. Um, number one is that Jesus died by crucifixion. So everybody would acknowledge that for the most part. Now, now there's a wider body of evidence that, that, that many historians, even non-believing historians, would accept as fact. Um, for example, James, who was just mentioned. Um, but we have, more, we have more evidence on Paul, so as you'll see in a moment, that's why um, he's mentioned and not James. Uh, but the next one is that very shortly after Jesus' death, the disciples had experiences that led them to believe and proclaim that Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to them. So, so this is a historical fact because you can't have Christianity apart from uh, a group of people saying Jesus died and now he's been raised. I mean, how do you account for the birth of the early church unless people had some kind of experience that led them to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? So that's a historical bedrock fact. And number three, within a few years of Jesus' death, Paul, also Saul, was converted after what he, what he interpreted as a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to him. Now, none of these three things are, are even making a move to Christianity. They're just basic historical facts that even the most skeptical people who are credible historians would acknowledge as true. So if you've got these facts... The question then is this, what hypothesis are you going to propose for how Christianity began? How do you, how do you resolve these things? What hypothesis will we come up with to account for why the early church believed that Jesus was raised and for why Paul did a complete 180? Um, so I'm going to hand out to you here in a moment here, just uh, three of these claims. Can I have people work as groups here? Um, let's have you three in the front be a group. Let's have, um, let's see, how about, well, let's do this, uh, how about right here, we'll split right here, you guys can all be a group, and then Kathy, Zach, George, and Joey can be a group, and you guys can be a group. All right, so one is the, Way, one secular worldview way of, of, of accounting for these facts is this. The claim that Jesus was raised from the dead developed decades after Jesus died. So this is just something that was kind of made up like later, like decades after. I'm going to have you guys work with this one. Uh, the disciples experienced hallucinations of Jesus after his death, which eventually led to the widespread belief that he was raised from the dead. So you guys can be the, halluc the hallucination group. And someone obviously stole the body, either the, either the disciples, the religious leaders, or the Romans. You guys can be that. So what I want you to do is take a few minutes and really think about this, the statement that you have, because each of these statements that you have is a secular worldview way of explaining these bedrock facts. Even the secular worldview would, for the most part, acknowledge that these facts are true but they will account for them through various hypotheses, and you have three of them. So take a look at them, and I want you to ask yourself, how would you respond to this hypothesis based on what you know about the resurrection and the evidence for it? So give that some time. Well, the claim, the disciples claimed it was three days before that Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so 
they need to sleep for what they need to defend with them. Cycles believe that. Right? Oh, I like that. That's very good. Yeah. And I think it said somewhere like it could 500 other people too. Yeah. So it's like you know, those 500 other guys might be going to take them decades. It's just to see it within the span of put it in your own Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 40 days. I allowed you some space in your study guide to kind of critique these. As we go through each of them, you can take some notes um, on, on why these theories don't really add up. Um, so someone obviously stole the body, either the disciples, the religious leaders, the Romans. What do you think about that? How would you respond? Well, for starters, like, they didn't have the money to disciples were to steal the body, then that, that means they would have seen that Jesus was still there, and they would know that everything that they stood for was a lie, so they wouldn't go to their death for a point that they knew wasn't true. Good. Yeah, those are two really good wow. points. So you've got this really scared group of disciples who are like, hey, we should probably hide, because we might get crucified like Jesus did, because we are, you know, his followers. Uh, and, and so that's why in the Gospels we hear that they're hiding behind locked doors. That's why they abandoned Jesus when he was arrested, right? And so can you imagine them, them all getting together and saying, let's go to the tomb and let's break through the Roman soldiers and the seal and let's roll it and let's get them out. And then, let's say that they did that, then they're going to go around having seen the dead body of Jesus, proclaiming at the risk of their life, he's risen, he's alive! I mean, that would be just unthinkable, right? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, now, and it doesn't make any sense that, the, uh, that anybody else would have stolen the body. Uh, so, for example, it doesn't make any sense that the Romans would steal the body uh, because they had soldiers guarding his tomb, right? Um, and they would w not want to add to this idea that he had been raised. And if people are going around saying... Jesus has been raised, I think that the Romans would just go exhume the body and say, actually, he has it. Yeah. Also, the disciples didn't uh, think, they admitted that they didn't think Jesus was even going to rise from the dead, even though Jesus told them they didn't get that part until it actually happened. They don't even get it. They don't even think it's going to happen because they're, while first century Jews did believe in the resurrection, they believed that it would be the resurrection of all people at the end of time. And it never crossed their mind that it would happen in advance to one person. Yeah. Okay, who's got the one, number two? The disciples experienced hallucinations of Jesus after his death, with, which eventually led to the widespread belief that he was raised from the dead. What about that? That's you. What are your criticisms of this? I'll share. Uh, I forget it. Can 500 people have the same hallucination at the same at, at different times? Right. So even if all 500 of the disciples got together on a mountain and tripped out on LSD together, <laughs> you know, did they have a? I don't know. I don't know if they did. Maybe they were eating mushrooms or something. But and then they all have the same hallucination, right? I mean, I, I just don't think that that really adds up. And then for them to actually go out to their death on the basis of a hallucination. And also, a lot of this is, is what happens is, is those in the secular worldview, a secular historian, is often trying to 
do psychology on people 2,000 years ago. It's hard enough to do psychology on people in, in, the, in the modern day and get a solid answer, a solid diagnosis. It's kind of hard to do it on people over 2,000 years ago. And there's really no real documentation of, of people having the same hallucinations in different places, right? Yeah. So what do you guys think about number three? The claim that Jesus was raised from the dead developed decades after Jesus died. Respond to me if I'm secular. Um, first of all, the women who were at the tomb and then the disciples and then the 500, they all believed it as it was happening. It wasn't like decades later they thought in retrospect, oh, he must have raised from the dead. And then um, even though the writings were decades later, there were a lot of the New Testament books are written to churches that the disciples have established already. So like that was happening right after Jesus ascended. They all spread out immediately. It wasn't later. That's a really good point, is that these churches were established very early, and they were also established upon practices that embody the death and resurrection of Jesus. Baptism is dying with Jesus and rising. That was practiced from the beginning. And also, the Lord's Supper is a remembering that Jesus died and he was raised from the dead. That was practiced from the beginning. So, by the year 51, 52, you're, you're getting this, uh, these letters written by Paul and they're talking about baptism and the Lord's Supper and the resurrection, this is all firmly established, like very close to the event. So it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, Paul, why did Paul forget about the women? Why didn't Paul in his, and then, and then, and then, and then, why didn't Paul mention the women? Because at the time, people don't really take the accounts of women seriously as like, test might have holds up in like, courts or whatever. Right, unfortunately, in the first century Roman world, the testimony of a woman did not hold up in court. And so, uh, while the Gospels talk about the women, um, which is interesting, there would have been great pressure to not include them as the first witnesses. While the Gospels do have that in there, uh, it may be that Paul, in talking to the Corinthians, who, you know, their culture might not have trusted the validity of a woman's account, they may, he may not have put it in there. Yeah. Okay. So now if you're secular though, you're still not going to believe in the resurrection. You're, you're going to have to go with one of these hypotheses, even if it's kind of doesn't make much sense. Now why is it? Well, because remember last week, remember Richard Dawkins, how he said, like, well, I can't, I believe in maybe design, that life was designed maybe by like extraterrestrial life, but it can't be God because that would be completely against my worldview. In the same way, you can't believe in the resurrection if, you, if your worldview doesn't allow for it. And, and so even if you have to bend over backwards to come up with explanations that don't really make any sense, um, that don't do justice to the evidence, you, st you still have to do that if, if, if your worldview doesn't fit resurrection. So uh, one of the reasons why uh, secular people will not believe the resurrection is because of uh, it really goes back to a philosopher by the name of David Hume. Uh, you've probably only heard of David Hume if you've had a philosophy class. Uh, but David Hume was a philosopher of the Enlightenment in the uh, 1700s. And look on your study guide here. I want us to go through these statements that he makes about how miracles can't happen. And I want you to write A for agree and D for disagree. Tell me, does the Christian worldview agree or disagree with these following statements? Number one, a miracle violates laws of nature. Do Christians agree or disagree with that? Agree. Agree, yeah. I mean, these things don't happen very often. That's why they're called miracles, because they violate laws of nature. Number two, Firm and unalterable experience has established these laws. Agree or disagree? These laws of nature. Um, yes, that we, we know these laws are the norm because we experience them as the norm. Sure, we, we'd give them that, yeah. Number three, everything experienced conforms to these laws, these laws of nature. Are there people who experience miracles? Yes. Yeah. Or at least they say they do. 
So does the experience of all people fit with just the laws of nature and the way things always work? No, I mean, so in, in many ways, uh, David Hume is being kind of like a, I'd say he's kind of like a Western white kind of elitist uh, thinker here. He, he's like, he's thinking he's smarter than people in Africa and Asia and Native Americans and other people in his European culture who would say they've experienced miracles. He's saying, well, I've never experienced a miracle, and the people that I hang out have it, so obviously they can't exist. But if you talk to, like, a lot of people in the world, there's going to be this experience of things that happen that are what, what we call supernatural. So, now, number four, nothing is experienced that does not conform to these laws. And then number five, all experience unites as proof against the miraculous. Well, we don't really agree with that because the collective experience of humanity does not unite as proof against the miraculous. Here's another five statements. Agree or disagree? A miracle is rare. Agree. Yeah. Two, laws of nature describe regular occurrence. The way things usually happen. Yeah, we agree. Three, evidence for the regular is always greater than evidence for the rare. Let's hold on to that one for a minute. Verse four, evidence must be weighed. Sure. Yeah. I think the New Testament believes that. Number five, the wise base beliefs on greatest evidence, which is always against miracles. Sometimes weird things happen. Yeah, and and also, what if all the evidence points to the resurrection? What do you do with that? Now, if your worldview will not allow it, then you can't allow it. You guys ever heard of the Kentucky meat shower? Back in the 1800s, there was like random meat that fell from the sky about the length of a football field in Connecticut, or not Connecticut, uh, Kentucky. Happened in Kentucky, and they, they have this like flesh like in jars, like, you know, it's embalmed. Um, and um, anyway, Scientific America, I think, did a little piece on this. Um, it, it's real meat, it's goat, goat's meat, and it fell from the sky. And one of the theories is that, you know, vultures, like birds of prey, uh, after they gorge themselves, if they're flying, if there's a disruption in the atmosphere, they might all of a sudden like, and, and then you have a meat shower. Now, that's a rare occurrence, but it happened apparently. Uh, my, my professor was telling us the story in, um, in one of our classes, and I'm like, that's weird. And I Googled it, and I looked, and sure enough, Scientific America has a piece on this. It's really interesting. Now, now, according to Hume, that could never happen because only normal things happen. Rare occurrences can't happen. Now, as far as the resurrection goes, this isn't like something that just happens all the time. The resurrection is like a once in human history thing. Like, this is the miracle of miracles. And yeah, it's rare, but if God exists, can this happen? I mean, if you're secular, God doesn't exist, so this can't happen. There's no way that a dead corpse can be given life. And you have to come up with some other explanation. But if you do believe that there is a God, then, well, this isn't really a problem, right? You see how worldview influences the way we look at this? So, once again, what if the, re the evidence, all the evidence points to the resurrection? Now, I want to just briefly mention a really great book. Um, I referenced it if you ever want to take a look at it. It's like 700 pages, so you might not have time to read it right now. Um, it's The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach by Michael Lacona. What Michael Lacona did is, is, as a historian, he said, I'm going to look at this question of the resurrection of Jesus and the various hypotheses that exist out there to account for these basic facts. So he's working with the three bedrock facts that most historians will acknowledge are true. He's like, how do we account for these things? And as a historian, what he did is he went through and he tested each of the hypotheses, the resurrection hypothesis included, 
according to strict historical criteria that historians use to determine the likelihood of other events. Number one, he used explanatory scope. Does the hypothesis explain the facts with the most relevant data? Number two, explanatory power. Does the hypothesis explain the facts in the clearest, simplest way without uh, bending over backwards? Three, plausibility. Does the hypothesis fit with what we already know to be true? Number four, less ad hoc, which means does the hypothesis rely on less non-evidenced assumptions? And number five, illumination. Does the hypothesis offer explanations to other historical problems as well? It's really interesting. Um, 700 pages later, this is what he comes up with. He says, look, all these different theories, like Jesus was a spirit, the psychological explanation, you know, that Jesus' friends all missed him so much that they made these stories up, the hallucination one, Gerd Ludemann, these are the historians that, that represent these. The church made it up for political reasons. John Dominic Crossan. A cultural explanation. And then you have the resurrection hypothesis. But do you see which one passes with flying colors? I mean, just measuring the resurrection hypothesis according to strict historical criteria yielded that the resurrection hypothesis passes, whereas the other ones fail on various other um, criteria, scope, power, plausibility, etc. Now let's talk about plausibility real quick though. Worldview, worldview is what determines this. If you believe in God, is it plausible that God could have raised Jesus from the dead if he had a specific reason to? Yes. If you are secular, is it plausible that a corpse would come alive? No. Uh, but yet, still, um, a lot of the uh, alternate theories are not plausible. They just don't explain the historical evidence very well. Now that's not to say that maybe someday somebody will come up with an explanation that really is credible, uh, but people have been after this for 2,000 years. I mean, if you go back and read um, some of the critics of Christianity, um, for example, a guy named Celsus who wrote uh, in debate with a church father named Origen, you hear that a lot of these theories have already been proposed in the past. Some of them have been really dismissed, like for sure, like the swoon theory that Jesus didn't actually die. That one is not really held up as credible by anybody. Back in the 1800s it was, but nobody really holds it credible now. The most common ones are going to be that the Gospels were written later and, and these things gradually developed, or the hallucination theory. Uh, but when you, you submit those to strict historical criteria and research, it just doesn't really add up very well. So I just want to end with the influence of worldviews. I want to give you a quote from atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel. And apply this to the resurrection. He says, I want atheism to be true. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. And in the same way, many people might approach the resurrection secretly or perhaps openly saying, I don't want there to be a resurrection. Because if there's a resurrection, that means that God is sovereign in control of all things and that he wins, right? That he lays claim to every square inch of our existence, right? Alright, so I feel like we could do like all of our sessions on the resurrection, but we don't have time for that. So we've just kind of dipped below the surface a little bit. I'm sending you two articles to read this week. Uh, one by a professor at MIT. I think he's a, he's a scientist at MIT. He talks about the resurrection. And then I think I'll send you something else that I wrote um, on my blog. So, thank you, everybody. Oh, next week is the last last session. And then after that, I'll give you your surveys, and you can do them, and then we'll be done. Cool. Thank you, everybody.